How's everybody doing? All right, so today, let me see if I can get this clicker to work. I hope I can. So today I'm going to talk about a, a project that we've uh, been doing for a couple of months, actually since uh, January of this year, called Mapping Police Violence. Uh, so in the aftermath of uh, August 9th, 2014, in Ferguson, Missouri, um, after Mike Brown was killed, uh, we had a situation in this country, really was a crisis of confidence and continues to be a crisis of confidence um, in the institution of policing. Um, but in that time, in the early days, there was a lot of questions uh, in the media and otherwise around, you know, to what extent is this a systemic problem? Is this a pattern? Or is this an isolated incident? Was Mike Brown an isolated incident? Was Eric Garner an isolated incident? These are questions that data can provide answers to, but unfortunately, um, official statistics were not comprehensive from the FBI, uh, from the CDC, et cetera, had not actually collected comprehensive data on police killings nationwide. Um, so fortunately, a number of crowdsourced databases did have that data, uh, or most of it at least. Uh, the Kill by Police database is one, Fatal Encounters is another. Um, combined, they actually had uh, over 1,100 records um, per year, so in 2014 as well as 2013. Um, of police killings, right? So the estimates of this is that this is about uh, 90, anywhere from 90 to 95% of the total of police killings in this country. We're actually capturing these databases and they've been here all along. It's just nobody had taken them, merged the two, filled in the gaps, and made sense of it to the world. And so that's what we did. We took the databases, we coded for, I don't know if you can see, we filled in the gaps around race, we filled in the gaps around whether people were armed or unarmed at the time that they were killed, uh, and other information in, t in terms of what was the initial uh, alleged crime that prompted that police intervention, uh, if there was one, et cetera. And so this is what we came up with. We found that nationwide in 2014, uh, 304 black people were killed by police in the United States, um, one uh, about every 28, 29 hours. By the numbers, so we've been compiling this data um, starting in 2013 and going into the present. We found uh, in 2013, uh, 1,141 people killed by police. 2014, 1,177. Uh, this year, to date, 976, so it's on pace to be a slight uptick. Um, so then we wanted to dive in and answer some questions, right? What are the questions around racial disparities? Um, what's really going on in terms of uh, particular places where there might be um, disproportionate police violence or places that are actually uh, managing to uh, have police that are not killing people. So we found that number one, uh, a majority of those killed by police were people of color um, and that there was a particular disparity facing black Americans. So black people in this country are three times more likely to be killed by police. Um, Black people are also twice as likely to be unarmed when they're killed by police as white people. About twice, a little bit less than twice. So we broke this down by place, right? Place matters. And so we found, we took the 100 largest cities in America and tried to map out the data. Uh, this is the 2014 data. So we can see here that, first of all, this is visualized, so I don't know how well you, you guys in the back can see it, but the first thing that pops out is when you code this by race, you color it by race, uh, you can see that the vast majority of people killed in uh, major U.S. cities by police are either black or brown. 56% are black. Uh, about 85% are people of color. Um, you can also see that there are particular disparities. So you look at Chicago, for example, 23 people killed in 2014, not one is white. Uh, you look at New York, it's, it's similar, LA, similar. Um, and also, what does this mean in terms of uh, proportions when you compare it to the overall homicide rate? So you take places, the highest rate of police violence in, in 2014 or police killings uh, was Oklahoma City followed by Orlando and Albuquerque. To give you a sense of what that means, in Oklahoma City in 2014, one in six homicides was committed by police and Albuquerque is one in four. Um, so clearly we have a problem. When the institutions that are meant to serve and protect are actually committing uh, a large proportion of the total number of homicides in a place, then we clearly have a problem, especially when it's disproportionately impacting black communities. So, of course, we mapped this out. We, we, it, it's important to remember that data is more than just you know, numbers. It's also about stories and people, and so we have those stories represented as well. But what's important when you have the data is that you can start to debunk some of these false narratives that have emerged. So the first one being that uh, somehow black people being killed by police are killed because they're committing violent crimes. So we found that uh, only about 29% of black people killed by police are uh, suspected of a violent crime and armed with a gun. We also found that there are cities that are um, tremendously problematic 
and there are cities that are actually uh, doing something right when it, when it regards the use of deadly force. So here's a comparison, uh, Newark and St. Louis. Um, this data goes back to 2013. So since 2013, again, St. Louis, Newark, similar population sizes, similar size black population, uh, similar rate of crime. They're both at the very high end in terms of uh, dangerous cities. Uh, but yet we've seen uh, no black people killed by police in Newark. Um, and crime is going down over that time, and 12 black people killed by police in St. Louis, and crime is going up, right? So folks who will have you believe that uh, people being killed by police is a necessary consequence of policing in high crime communities, it obviously is not. So we use the data to actually inform policy, right? It's one thing to talk about the problem, it's another to propose solutions. And so what we did was we mapped out what was the circumstance that initiated um, those altercations. We found that about 10% of people killed by police uh, in 2014, it was due to a broken windows type offense, these quality of life offenses, things like uh, selling loose cigarettes, loitering, um, uh, things like that, right? Um, jaywalking, etc. About 15% were actually people who had not committed any crime, but they were having a mental health crisis at home, and police were called to deal with that crisis. Of course, it should be a mental health professional or somebody who is trained to deal with that instead of a police officer whose first reaction is to use force. Um, we also found that you know, a number of these were traffic violations, and a very small proportion, again, about a third, were actually people who were doing criminal acts that were not broken windows or these sort of low-level, nonviolent offenses that could be argued shouldn't have been uh, a police intervention in the first place, uh, and were armed with a gun, right? So for folks who are going to say um, that their police violence is justified, I mean, they're really talking about this third here, and even then, uh, other countries provide examples of how to deal with these situations in ways that do not kill people. Uh, and so this information informed a campaign uh, that we launched in collaboration with activists across the country called Campaign Zero, uh, which aims to end police violence in this country uh, and proposes 10 broad policy solution areas to do so. Uh, ending broken windows policing, uh, empowered effective community oversight, limiting police use of force, independent investigations and prosecutions, community representation uh, on, uh, on the police force, body cameras and filming the police, making sure that these are used as tools for accountability and transparency and not surveillance, uh, training, including racial bias training and testing linked to performance evaluations, ending for-profit policing, civil asset forfeiture, those types of things, demilitarization, uh, which Brother Dante talked about earlier, uh, and fair police union contracts. I know we have the FOP in the house. Um, this is an issue that hasn't got a lot of play, but it is when you look, we pulled the, uh, for the 100 largest cities, we pulled their police union contracts. There are a number of provisions in there that are actually impediments to accountability, preventing civilian oversight from having discipline power, preventing officers from having to give statements initially, uh, immediately following an incident, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we pulled out some of those recommendations as well. And so I hope you'll take a look at it. Uh, and together, I think we can win. Thank you.